Hello, everyone, and welcome to the uh, Brews and Bites episode titled uh, Everything Online, How Global Connectivity Benefits Our World. This is our 10th episode. We have some great guests, but before uh, we get to introductions, just want to get some housekeeping items off the table. Uh, we have some great attachments attached to the webinar there to the to the right of your screen or possibly to the left of your screen, depending on how you have things oriented. Uh, if you do want to ask questions, go ahead and ask questions. Uh, we'll try to work them in. And for some reason, uh, we don't answer your question during the webinar. We will follow up directly with you. And uh, with that, I want to introduce uh, my guests. If you have watched Brews and Bites before, then you have seen Tony Barbagallo before. He's the CEO of Coringo. I'll let him say hi and introduce himself really fast. Tony, do you want to go ahead and do that? Hello, yeah. Tony Barbagal, CEO of Coringo. Happy to be here. And then uh, the true star of this Brews and Bites <laughs> is uh, Phil Buckley Malore. And Phil is with BT. He is infrastructure designer for BT Services Platform. And Phil, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, hi, yeah, I'm Phil Buckley Miller. Uh, as I said, I'm infrastructure designer for, for uh, British Telecom, uh, specifically in the uh, the division of British Telecom that's focused on our multi millions of customers. So this would be uh, broadband, mobile, TV, sport, email, those kind of services that we uh, we currently provide. And I generally look after our data centers, service, storage, that kind of thing. And Phil, what's your background? Where, where did he come from? Have you have you always worked for BT or, or not at all? There's a lot of people in BT who have spent their entire career there. But no, I joined about 15 years ago. Prior to that, I had about 15 years or so um, working in uh, essentially finance IT, really trading floors, banks, that kind of thing for what is now called Accenture. It was Anderson Consulting when I was there, and uh, I joined BT yeah about 15 years ago or so to create what became BT TV today. Uh, it was a kind of white sheet of paper with nobody uh, really uh, you know would, was doing that kind of thing back then uh, it was a real challenge and, and, and one we you know we continue to enjoy running yeah all right so you've always had some really good solid experience in low latency uh, kind of high high pressure environments I guess is uh, how you yeah. <laughs> I've always enjoyed the bigger challenges. Yeah, I mean, I think I probably struggle at a small startup maybe. Uh, I yeah. do quite like um, I tend to big build big systems, and big systems usually need a few uh, pounds, dollars behind them. So yeah, I tend to, to work for larger organizations, really. Yeah, and um, this wouldn't be brews and bites if we didn't ask the question, you know, what, what brew are you drinking? So we'll start with you, Tony. What brew are you drinking? Well, you know, it is uh, fairly early in the morning here in California. So while I have my beer mug, um, it is filled with a nice uh, blend of coffee with caffeine. Oh, okay. And Phil, what are you drinking? I've got a um, Chianti Reserva. Um, it's gone five o'clock here. So. Oh, well, it's five o'clock somewhere then. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> Actually, exactly. Yeah. So it's, cheers. And I'm, I'm drinking my, my green tea in my Jack Skeleton mug, of course. So we'll, we'll enjoy our brews as we have a great discussion. So, you know, the topic today is everything online, how global connectivity benefits our world. I don't think we need to set the stage for anyone. Everyone's kind of going through the same thing. Um, but if, if we, we always talk about having everything accessible, if broadband wasn't in the state that it's in today, I think the world would be in a lot more of a mess than it already is. Um, so, you know, can, can you tell us a little bit about, you know, when you first started with BT, where things were and where things are now, how, how things have changed from a well, connectivity perspective? It's really just overall bandwidth. I remember when we when we started TV, the, the, it was a proper engineering job. We really, to, nobody was like, say, not many people were really doing um, video on demand at all. And in the UK, the average uh, broadband speed was about two megabit per second. So we had to think about things in very, very different terms then. We really only had SDTV for a start. There weren't things uh, that we now know as content delivery networks, your Akamai and Lime Lights and stuff like that were just on the, just starting. And so, you know, we had to uh, figure out uh, all of the me mechanics really of getting video from a single place down closer to, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of users. Um, and I can say it was what I consider to be quite a lot of engineering, even just, just small things like disks. 
um, SSDs, are, they're everywhere now, and we use them for everything. But they they existed then, but they were commercially un, unavailable, really, at the, the volumes we needed because we were storing videos, right? So we, um, we had to use and design very large disk-based systems that were distributed around the UK. Uh, as well and maintain them and these were spinny discs and we had to have what many very many of them to get the kind of random access that we needed to be able to deliver the video um, and you know even then it worked it worked fine we were certainly the first in Europe to, to do that kind of thing I know that um, AT&T's U-verse was kind of neck and neck with us uh, at the time um, but obviously since then Broadband speeds are through the roof. You know, we've got hundreds of megabits available for, you know, uh, relatively cheap prices. Um, and actually building a, a video on demand platform nowadays is pretty much just like writing a check, really. You can just buy multi-core CPUs, really fast G um, um, uh, network cards, um, firewalls fly along at the speeds you want them to, and, and, and the storage is both plentiful and amazing for dealing with random uh, users watching different programs at different times. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know where it's going from now, but uh, right now, what was hard even 15 years ago is comparatively straightforward. Well, Tony, maybe talk, talk to the same point from the storage perspective. So, you know, Phil said he doesn't know where it's going. So, you know, where, where were we? Where are we? And kind of where, where do you think we're going from a storage perspective? Sure. I mean, you, you know, to Phil's point, everything was slow uh, from the from ability to actually stream in real time. You really... It was really a memory issue back then. You had to get the data from storage to memory. I remember back in the late 90s working at VXtreme where uh, we had a, break, a breakthrough with, with video that was the size of a quarter you know, on your screen. And uh, so we have certainly come a long way. And back then, it was all about how much memory you could, uh, you could cram into a, to a device. It really had less to do with uh, storage and more to do with how big your cache was because you had to get the, the data into cache before you could even have a hope of streaming it. And most of that even was really for uh, distance uh, distance learning, either a local area network or wide area network, certainly not uh, not over the internet as, as things have happened now. And, and now we just don't even give it a second thought. Yeah, so I mean, along with that, uh, let, let's talk content and, and digitization and and just kind of get to the heart of this discussion. I mean, should everything be kept online? We're, we're creating a, a ton of data. Everyone's creating everything. Everyone has an HD 4K camera now in their pocket. Uh, should should everything created by by people, by individuals, and by organizations uh, be kept and be kept online? So we'll start with you, Phil. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I've got a potentially slightly unusual view on this. In that I'm a technologist, and I. Uh, I know what's, what we can do, but just because we can do something doesn't necessarily mean we should. I think we need to be responsible as technologists to content creators, because I'm not one. I mean, I know we're creating some content now, but it's not, you know, it's not what I think any of us do uh, for a career. And I know musicians and actors and uh, video uh, editors and a whole bunch of people, and they feel utterly under threat by the... Um, ease of which their work can be taken advantage of, you know? Uh, and I think that we need to uh, look at our capabilities, which are strong. We can store everything, you know, in human history quite easily these days, pretty much, and continue to do so as we go on. But I also think we need to engage with um, content creators and also content um owners as well which can be often different things as well in terms of if you look at who actually owns the contents on say youtube compared to uh it being the actual content creators or youtube you know there's a lot of intermediaries and say can we get a middle ground something that serves as many purposes as possible something that does allow content creators to have control over the monetization of their work and the security of their work and the same for the uh for those intermediaries, those those management companies and whatever. Otherwise, you could end up with a situation where uh, you some you will remember it where CD music used to cost a lot of money. So as soon as people could steal it via Napster and so on, if people remember them, mm -hmm. they did. So what happened was is that we met not in the middle ground, not between potentially quite expensive uh, music costs or free, 
we ended up with streaming services, which serves the streaming companies far, far better than the content creators. They often don't have the control and certainly don't have the revenue that's coming in for them as well. So I think that whatever we do from a technology perspective, and we can do a lot, and we can do a lot in great value, reliably, across the globe. We absolutely can. I think we also have to be mindful that we're only part of the, 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 the whole solution and that what we really need is the content creators to act together as one to ensure that their rights are um, are looked after as well as, as, as we're capable of delivering their, their uh, product. Yeah, Tony, same, same, same question to you, Tony. Sure. I mean, should everything be kept online? I mean, Phil, Phil came up with a lot of good points about DRM and monetization. Um, right. how, how do you feel? Well, you know, as an, as an infrastructure uh, provider, I'm not sure that uh, uh, our opinion necessarily matters in that regard. I think what we have to be concerned about and what we are concerned about in our product is to make it flexible enough that the content owner or content deliverer, in your case, uh, uh, Phil, has the flexibility um, to decide who can access which content. I think ultimately your content, if you're taking a video, it is going to be online somewhere. The question is, is it going to be accessible and by whom? Um, so for instance, you know, in our, in our product, we have uh, you know, full authorization and authentication capabilities. Um, you, know, you can actually um, give access to a, to a link to a video which expires in say 24 hours. So, you know, things like that. So things are, aren't forgotten and kept online for, for everyone to see forever. But, but so those capabilities are things that we need to provide as, as an infrastructure uh, solution so that, uh, so that the users and the administrators can actually manage the access to their, you know, uh, precious content as they see fit. Just to interject, one area that, I mean, it's easy to talk about in terms of uh, content, video and audio. Okay, that's the, that's the most default uh, thing, that, thing that we think of. But actually, um, there is a lot of other opportunities coming up. As we move towards, say, things like 8K displays being the norm, which I don't think we're very far away from that being the case, um, you get into the opportunity to do things like art. Um, which, you know, I think needs to be considered to be just as, as um, important as, as, as those you know, music and video things as well. And I think the idea of being able to sit at home and look through, say, an 8K image of not just the great painters of the world, but, you know, new stuff that's coming along and, and, and things, and actually be able to understand the textures that are involved. We've never been able to do that. You know, we've really not. And with 8K in particular, it really becomes an option. We get that ability to, to look to move only about 18 inches away before we stop being able to see individual pixels, which is what we do with paint, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's quite quite important. And also, I think the potential to be able to use um, effectively um, video or, or a video system to walk around 3d art as well sculpture or installation of art and so is again another opportunity for us to use bandwidth storage and great video quality as well so I'm sorry yeah you bring, no you bring up a really good point about packaging you know, my my first half of uh, my professional career was in digital audio and um, I was on the front lines with mp3 and saw it wasn't just a price, it was a packaging issue. It was that CDs were stuck in the album. And then you, you know, there, there was a lot of songs that you didn't like around the album. You only liked yeah. one or two songs. So at the end of the day, it was a lot better package to have just a single MP3. I, I understand what you're saying with art. Uh, it's a package, you have to go somewhere to enjoy yeah. it. Now you can really see and feel exactly what the artist is trying to convey. Are, are there those kind of same packaging things that are happening on, on the video side or, or from the kind of home delivery side yeah. that you're seeing from, from video on demand? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, where once there were large, you know, very few TV stations, say, in the UK that, you know, I remember back to there being essentially really just three TV stations in the UK. And obviously that's exploded massively, which is all well and good if you've got in, uh, if you're looking at a, a wide range of TV uh, output, mm -hmm. you know, all manner of different uh, specific kinds of TV. You know, we have a, a TV called the Caravan Channel in the UK. They just talk about caravans, you know, it's, that's great to have the choice. But when it comes to things that are very popular, sports usually, and something I, I have a, 
professional interest as well because BT Sport essentially has um, the broadcasting rights to a lot of exclusive content in the UK. Um, you are seeing uh, us moving away from um, having a single provider of a given say sport through to now at the moment if you want to watch uh, domestic football in the uk you, you can watch it certain games on the bbc certain games on sky certain games on, on bt sport and certain games now on amazon as well and i um i think we're going through a transitory period absolutely and i think that we're going to see that change i think we uh, i worry that we'll see consolidation and that single large companies will come along and uh, scoop up all the rights um, but at the same time, I think having that too much proliferation is, is a problem as well. Uh, but either way, the, the great thing from a, a professional perspective is that this is really interesting data streams or data files to, to have to manage and to distribute and deliver uh, safely and securely as well. You know, the security of, of video deliveries are really key part of, uh, of what we do. So, yeah, it's, it's changing times. It's a lot of fun, uh, but I, don't, I wish I had a crystal ball. Yeah. Tony, what do you what do you predict? I know Tony, you come from the streaming side in the first half of your mm -hmm. professional career too. Um, so, I mean, what what do you predict from from a value added perspective? What what we're going to see? I mean, we we've, we've seen a huge shift in sports. I think it's really it's really neat to actually hear what goes on in the sidelines, and you you can hear everything. Right. You're getting yeah, just a much more intimate intimate experience. Um, where, where do you think things are going, and do you think we'll see those kind of experiences moving forward? Yeah, I think we're starting down that trend, and I think it's all about, as, as Phil pointed out early on, it's the proliferation of bandwidth that is making all this possible. But I'm still looking for the day where, you know, your TVs are interactive touchscreens and you can decide which angle on the sport on the, on the sporting event you want to view. If, oh, did I? <laughs> <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for that day, or, or only listen to the sidelines. You know, they've sort of done that with, uh, with Blu-ray movies now, um, which takes a lot of preparation, um, and it's still a little bit clunky. But imagine being able to do that live again. It's based on the bandwidth and the distribution networks. I think that, uh, that we're starting to see pop up. It is. I mean, we, we're very lucky in some ways in that we're, uh, we're really the. There's no two ways about it. Sky in the UK have uh, a bigger presence than us, bigger customers than a uh, more you know, bigger customer base, and probably more content than us. But uh, we are we're kind of famous really for um, having really high quality, uh, in particular video quality, our commentary, uh, and also our metadata around our games. So if you're watching um, uh, one of our games on, uh, say, an iPad or phone we have the ability to be able to have a timeline along the bottom of the phone where it shows you key events uh, red cards which if it's soccer it's when people go off you know sin bin in, in ice hockey order and um, and goals and pe penalties things like that and you can skip straight to them and as soon as you watch that little highlight you go back to the live game right and that's mm -hmm. great but we've also um pioneered the ability to have multiple angles of real cameras, because obviously if, if you've ever been to a sports game, you know that most games are actually being covered by anywhere up to 24, 48 different cameras around the, the, the stadium. And the ability to switch them, we, we've already uh, been delivered that as well. The one thing that was really, really cool was VR. We have for for select games, really the big games. We've had the ability to uh, put on a variety of different kind of VR headsets and move around live while the game's on and you can actually sort of see uh, in the stadium different dots where other virtual cameras are and move to them and see the different angles now that's that's stuff that we've been doing for two years i'd say maybe maybe, maybe not much more than that but about two years but we recently just won an award at uh, one of the tv broadcast um um uh, events it was had to be done vir virtually of course this year but um where we demonstrated the ability to um essentially move around the pitch to any position hmm. using the, a mixture of live uh, of multiple live images and essentially interpolation so you can actually uh, and, and the players actually move along it, it, if you're not absolutely perfectly in the right place it doesn't always look exactly perfect but it's not a bad starter and yeah this lets you go and sit behind the goalkeeper or on the sidelines or you know whatever uh, there's limitations right now but for a, essentially a version 1.0 which is really where we are right now mm -hmm. it's pretty good and and that's a combination of a lot of bandwidth but also a lot of compute which would normally when it comes to uh, 
uh, broadcast stuff computes pretty low really you're just shifting bytes around really well mm -hmm. around yeah. but in this particular case it's a combination of um, quite a few technologies to allow for um spotting what's a player and what's the pitch and then the different angles and moving those players around it's almost a little bit like um a, a table football i don't know if you're aware of table football where you have kind of characters moving around yeah um, yeah so so yeah there's a lot going there's an awful lot going ahead uh, on this as well we did 3d uh, football as well but 3d on tvs has kind of died to death hasn't it you know yes, you can't yeah. buy a 3d tv anymore you can't yeah. nobody makes it and is that a, an added subscription uh no. that, that you have to subscribe to, no. to to get that service no wow well the, the cost yeah. the cost of producing tv is the licensing mostly you know be having the ability to walk into a place with cameras and then the actual having the people manning the cameras on site and the mixing crew and the uh, outside broadcasting uh, stuff as well so that once you've actually capturing the data into a number of different cameras you are uh, you can do it with, with that what you like um, where I think we could possibly do a little bit better is in storing uh, that data as well for um, later viewing as well. Typically, that, that the contracts that we have don't allow us to necessarily uh, store that for, for, for VOD forever. Um, but I think that will change. I think that will be great to be able to go back and watch a game from 10 years ago or, or whatever. You know, I think right now we can't do that, I don't think, unless it's a special game. You know. Mm. Anyway, sorry, I'll, I'll let somebody else speak for a while. No, that's great. Oh, no, no, it's good. I mean, we, we don't have that here in the U.S. I mean, we would we would love to have that here. Well, of course, one of the problems is the size of the market. You know, you have all of the broadcast channels, you know, your ABCs for football and whatever, and they're hitting how many tens of millions? Uh, it's the same with Sky as well. They, they have, you know, two or three times the customer base as, as us. We have the ability to maybe a little be a bit more daring because of our mm -hmm. size. You know, we, we, uh, we're, we're very lucky in that respect. From a storage perspective, how much more storage does that approach use, or, or if 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 at all, if if more storage at all? More storage in total, absolutely, it does it does increase quite a bit. It's whether you mean um, short term storage, you know, uh, the games are typically sort of ninety minutes, two hours, that kind of thing. Um, the short term storage has has increased quite a lot just simply because you have to capture that and run back to different places and whatever. But the long-term storage for it is, um, again, as I mentioned, is not quite so important because we typically don't hold those games for more than maybe a week or so. And even then it might only be from a single angle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Is there no, uh, I was going to say, who has the repository of those games though? That's <laughs> Not to yeah. BT. It's not so much having the repository; it's having the, the the contractual rights to to retain them and to potentially reshow them mm -hmm. because, because of the uh, you know the broadcasting right. Uh, right. right. Yeah. And that usually goes at least here. That usually goes back to the club, the NFL, yeah. for instance. Oh, in ours, it goes back to like the organization. So yeah, yeah like the. Uh, yeah, football association or, or rugby league, or because obviously we have different sports from you, generally. Yeah, <laughs> and that is something that we're seeing, Tony. Right? Is is uh, different leagues and different teams uh, signing on for for long term storage? That that is a trend right. we see here in the U.S. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we're starting to we're starting to uh, uh, get into opportunities with individual sports teams, whether yeah. well, Real Salt Lake and uh, Major League Soccer. Major League Baseball teams, they all are the individual teams in addition to the franchise in general, the club in general, the individual teams are actually starting to keep their own. And they, they probably always have, but they've never in, they've never historically wanted to be able to set up a streaming service for, you know, for their archived uh, events. Well, we have a little bit of that in the UK in that both Manchester United and Chelsea football clubs, which are two of our larger, better funded clubs, have their own channels. Okay. You can actually, like 24 hours a day, you can sit and sure. watch interviews and, and whatever. I think it's quite, I quite appreciate that. I don't particularly like those two teams, but I quite like that you can do that, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think for smaller clubs that can't afford that, doing that online would be fantastic. I mean, I don't know if you're aware, but we have a really small club in the UK called Wrexham. Wrexham's a tiny town. It's like 25,000 people. It's, it's a really nice town, but it's fine. Ryan Reynolds just bought it. Well, he's just in the process oh, of buying it. Yeah. And um, 
I can't remember Brian Reynolds and somebody else who's in another comedy series. I can't remember in America, and they just they just come over to the UK literally in the last like twenty four hours, and they're buying this little sports club. Wouldn't it be great if they took the opportunity to, of the investment to say, you know, we're going to kind of own a lot of our content and manage mm -hmm. it, and distribute it all, or you know, I, I think it's a real opportunity. Sorry, it's just new yeah. news. Yeah, well, yeah. You can certainly afford it now after he sold his gin company. So I think he that's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that, that's why he went and bought a club because he sold his gin company. Uh, <laughs> a few hundred, yeah, they, a few hundred million dollars. They, 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 make, they make a lot of money, that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. indeed. Um, so, you know, I, I know we're, we're, we're coming up to, to the end of, of Brews and Bites here. It goes really fast. Um, so if, if someone were to want to put everything online, all right, we, we talked about digital rights management, we talked about security, we talked about monetization, but let's say you know they, they are an organization, they're a sports team, they're a media organization, they do wanna put everything that they create online. Where do they start? And, and I wanna hear your, the responses from both of you. Maybe we'll start with you, Tony, and, and we'll end with you, Phil, but where, where does an organization start? Sure, well, and it all depends if it's if it's uh, new content or they're, or they're thinking about making existing content uh, available and accessible. You know, in the case of uh, some of the teams that, that we've been talking to, they've they've had historical content on tape. And unless you set up a, a very elaborate infrastructure, you're not going to be able to stream that content on demand, demand very easily, if at all. Uh, so there's so there's one notion of how do you move? How do you move that content from tape to something that's more accessible and economical? Uh, versus, uh, in the, I think, in the case of BT, how are you taking care of that short-term weekly content? So there's sort of two different uh, different use cases. So we've we've clearly been involved in both of them, but um, you know, primarily as as you know, object storage meant for long-term archive. We're seeing a lot of uh, opportunities where we're actually replacing tape as uh, with disc, with just spinning disc as a a suitable enough infrastructure for uh, for being able to do on-demand streaming of your say your favorite players, player search for your say, favorite player highlights, or or even past games. Yeah, yeah. Same yeah, question. Well, to you. I mean, the, the I think the key point here is is that most content creators, whether they're you know sports clubs or individuals or whatever, typically are technologists, and mm -hmm. therefore they. What I would suggest that they do is to look for. Uh, initially a good media asset management system right mm -hmm. something that's going to um allow them to simple something simpler typically if they're going to start doing this they don't need complex features just yet right they can work that out later but um, you know a simple straightforward easy to use content management system that also takes care of the technicalities in the background as well uh takes care of archiving and and so on um, because it's really easy the default option will be to just go and buy a bunch of hard disks right hard disks are quite cheap these days Mm -hmm. but that's not the that's not the complex bit. The complex bit is making all of those hard disks work, maybe making multiple sites full of hard disks work, you know, and multiple data centers. And really, that's where um, I think you need to go and look for um, a software vendor or infrastructure vendor that can make what is a very complicated solution easily accessible, easily manageable, reliable. And that way, you're really going to be able to go from creating that content, publishing the content, and back straight away to, to creating the content again, because that's your job. Mm -hmm. yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. That makes sense. Media asset management system um, th that has all of that good technology stuff built into the back end that you don't have to see, unless mm -hmm. you want to. You know? sure. that, that, that would be my key. You know? yeah. It's the hardware. And then so what, I mean, this is maybe a shameless plug for BT, but where, where does BT fit into that picture? Uh, what, what kind of services uh, can BT help our viewers with? Well, we have a lot of different, uh, in terms of sort of storage and, and that kind of thing. Yeah, we, we, we have a lot. I mean, we uh, have a number of different services at the moment for uh, our customers are able to, um, they have a bit of a, essentially web web storage that every all of our broadband users get. They get to use that. We provide them with a client for sort of Windows, PC, and a few other things, uh, a Mac and things. And um, that allows them to do things like video and phone storage, uh, photo storage, and things like that, right? So so that's, that's part of it. And, and obviously, as you can imagine, that's um, about value. You know, from our perspective, that's all about uh, providing uh, 
as good a value service because the performance is less of an issue. Um, but uh, at the other side of the scale, you've got the, the TV streaming stuff as well. You know, people don't want to wait around. They press play when they want to watch, you know, Die Hard 19 or whatever it is that they want to watch. And they want that up in, you know, two or three seconds, worst case, because they're used to it from Netflix and from Prime and, and several mm. other companies as well. So we have quite a a broad gamut of, of requirements really and we have to address them all uh, on a per service basis really so it's quite nice to have um uh, you know companies such as yourselves out there as well as a, as a really useful option uh, and that that's going to fit into some some of those services and be uh, absolutely usable Yep, I, th I think you summarize that well. BT does so much. I know it's hard. It's hard to, to say everything that BT does uh, okay. because you do so many things. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but and and this is uh, you know we're coming to the end of the show again, and we always like to end with the guests sharing words of encouragement. So these could be general words of encouragement, either in life, words of encouragement for this particular topic. Um, you know, feel feel free to, to say what you want, but we'll start with Tony so you can see what Tony says, and then uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> All right, Tony. Where, where's the current <laughs> yes. star view? As I there? sip from my as I sip from my coffee and realize that it is five o'clock somewhere, I could have changed the beverage in here. Exactly. But you know, I think uh, as we continue on with this pandemic, it's really about staying safe and staying healthy. Uh, and I think that's that's really uh, that's really where I would end it here. Okay. All right. Um, I you, I did know I had to do this bit, and I can't I can't I didn't really think about it too much, but um, I, d I did think about it in in one terms. I've been um, providing some training to some of our younger members of the team recently, and one of the things I wanted to explain to them, and and did fairly recently, so it's on the top of my mind, was that essentially. I and lots of other people in my organization and my friends or whatever, we're really system admins when it comes down to it. System admins, glorified system admins, you know. Um, we go and look at products and we, we plug them together and make new services, right? And that's great. And there's such a lot of focus on keeping those services running, okay? Always keeping them running, you know, keeping Amazon up, keeping whoever up. And that's really important to money coming in to any given business or, or whatever. But one of the things I wanted to explain to them, and I honestly stand by this very, very strongly, is that our, as system admins, you know, data admins, whatever it is um, that we do, the most important thing we do is keep our current data. We retain the data we're in now. We can lose service, it happens. Right? But we must hold on to our data so that we can restart service. Yeah. yeah? If we lose our data, whatever it is, customer you know, videos, customer data, orders, whatever, there's no point in coming back. Right? Yeah. If we've got an outage. And I, I wanted them to understand that I've been doing this for like 30 years or so now, and that that realization had changed the way I thought about in particular data storage, that it's our objective to keep it so that we can start service again, whether that's a minute later or a day later or whatever. We have outages, power goes out, or people try and hack you or whatever, right? But it's about that, and I can't overstate it. A lot of people, younger people in particular, just don't think about that. They think all the pressure is about keeping service on the go because people are shouting them at them about it. No one's shouting at them about, you must make sure your backups are good. They must make sure your data resilience is good. Yeah. So, yeah, that's right. So, yeah. Right until right until the data is gone, then they'll get shouted yeah. at. Exactly. So yeah, that, yeah. that would be yeah. Yeah. I, I, that's that, those are great uh, words of encouragement. I think uh, you know make make sure the data is safe. Yeah. Um, and with that, I think I think that's a that's a good place to end our discussion today. So it, it's been great having both of you. Uh, so uh, Phil, thank you so much for joining us. I know it's uh, it's probably time for another glass of wine soon. Uh, Tony, as always, thank you very much. And um, any any final closing words you you want to you want to say to the viewers out there, or, or just uh, just a goodbye? Cheers! Cheers! Each other. There we go. Cheers! All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye.